Welcome to the K-12 online conference. My name is David Jakes and I'm going to be talking about reimagining the spaces in which we learn. This is the second video in a series of four. Uh, previously I talked about mindset and establishing a mindset in lens about how we think about space. This video I'll be discussing the landscape of spatial change in terms of what spaces look like currently in school, beyond schools, and how we design contemporary and agile spaces for learning. So the first question is, is you know, where do you start? And we, we started uh, addressing that question in the previous video, but you know, in that video we talked about uh, spaces as a third teacher and the importance of elevating the role that spaces play in learning and teaching and learning. We talked about teachers as designers and being able to craft more contemporary kinds of experiences for students when they have more contemporary spaces to work with. We also talked about language and how critical that is in terms of shifting mindsets and perspectives about the role of spaces. I mentioned moving from a classroom to a studio model and the role of that simple change in nomenclature may play in the perception of what that space can be and how it's valued in, in an education. Uh, if you're going, any organizational change uh, and spatial change is certainly part of that, is that you have to have a language capable of supporting that change. So the, the next step really, uh, you know, and the key consideration, and this was mentioned in the first video as well, is what do you want the experience at school to be? This is the formative question that has to be addressed. It's a focus on experience and not things. And by things, I mean technology and furniture and lighting and things like that. But a clear definition and a set of expectations for the learner experience at school is really important. And you need that to move forward in terms of how you design spaces. My friend Ryan Breitag asks that question a little bit different way. And he says, do you have the habitats to support the habits you wish students to develop? And that's, an, that's a really creative way to explain that. And it captures the movement in schools today to, to rethink what learning looks like, the boundaries uh, of where learning occurs, and so on. So we have a lot of discussion in education today about what a contemporary learning experience can look like. And it can be summarized, in, in my thinking at least, in some of these educational trends. And I'm going to present those and talk briefly about each one. So all these trends, of course, have spatial implications. If we're going to shift what learning looks like in schools, we have to have the habitats to support that. So you know, there's a, a, a large amount of discussion about personalized and personal learning in schools and how we grant agency to kids to make their own choices about learning and the pathways that they assume for learning. We know that one-to-one -one technology has been in play for a long time. We know that there are schools that have been five to six years into this, but we also know that schools are just stepping into it. So we talked in the first video about being able to connect to people, ideas, and resources you know, through technology and what that might mean for learning. That can take us to blended learning or online learning. And with Pokemon Go, uh, and renewed interest in what and how we shape virtual learning in schools. There's also an opportunity for on-demand learning and just-in-time learning. More on that in just a second. And schools, almost all schools now, are, are jumping into the notion of making and, and having maker spaces and what that means for the kind of experience kids have at school. Beyond that, uh, there are there is a high degree of interest in saying that or thinking about community-based education, world-based education, and literally learning beyond the brick and mortar walls of, of, of traditional schools. So the opportunity in all this is that when you look at this list, these are challenges to our traditional mindset about learning. They are things that potentially can take learning forward in, in, in creating new kinds of experience for kids. But in every single one of these cases, there has to be a consideration of space. Space is a third teacher, right? We have to elevate the notion of space that space plays. And all the things that you're looking at on the screen right now certainly have spatial implications. And there's an opportunity to use these because these represent experience, right? And they can inform, if we unpack these and what they look like as an experience for kids, they can inform the kinds of spaces that we want for kids. So there is an opportunity uh, for that. And the question now that you have to think about is if those, those kinds of ideas are important to you or if your school is exploring those ideas or some ideas that might not have been on the list, what are the spatial implications for those new kinds of experiences?
So let's let's explore this first slide, and this is uh, something that when I show this slide to educators in a, in a live presentation, everybody starts sort of chuckling and laughing a little bit, because you normally wouldn't think that physical education is something that would have a you know be done through an online kind of course. It's completely disruptive to our thinking and our traditional thinking about what what physical education is. But when you start thinking about that, when you start thinking about the technology and Fitbits and all that, when you talk, think about the fact that kids could literally work with a personal trainer for four hours a week and document that with technology and submit that, you start to realize that there is a possibility that an online experience and, and what that means in terms of allowing kids to shape their own perspectives about physical education and where, and where, where that took place and when it took place is something that's pretty intriguing. And so, you know, the connection to digital spaces is interesting uh, in reshaping our whole thinking about traditional educational structures in a new way has implications for spatial design. You know, Harvard has launched a virtual classroom for students anywhere. And when you look at this, you know, it's not what it is now, but it's what it can become, I think. In a lot of cases, this is sort of like a virtual um, lecture hall. but the interesting thing is that that people are distributed now around the world and people now around the world potentially could have access to this course and so what happens when we start to thinking about the combination of physical spaces and digital spaces in combination how can we start to use the incredible affordances of digital technology to extend our thinking about space and about learning in Illinois where I live we're going to test snow days, online snow days. And while I think that online learning can doesn't need a snow day to, to exist, I think this is sort of an intriguing kind of idea, and it's a step into exploring the power of distributed and connected to, in online learning. And so now when we're not engaged in physical space, when kids are spread out through the community and still have to learn, how does a digital space step in? How do we craft pedagogical approaches that make sense? How do we prepare kids to be more online learners? How do we prepare them to be asynchronous learners? There's a whole series of questions that come into play as these disruptive kinds of thoughts about where education takes place in the landscape of spaces that can support that. The intersection of that is, is, is intriguing. We also have, we know that, and you're probably familiar with this, is Google-powered VR with, with Google Expeditions. We know that, that virtual reality and being able to engage kids in a different way through VR technology is something that's, that's sort of interesting. Kids, of course, are immediately attracted to this. The other thing that I'm interested in in, in terms of virtual reality is location-based kind of a software. This is Bluebeam, and what it looks like is when you you have a blue beam are these these little disks that you see here that communicate and send out and broadcast a beacon literally to a cell phone that has the blue beam app on it so imagine a case where you're in a library you have you have a career section let's say and you have a career event happening on Wednesday night and so a student that has the app on their phone walks into the career section the disk perceives that somebody is in their space in the career area and broadcasts out to the student that that uh, event is going to take place on Wednesday and so a really cool thing is that what happens when the spaces themselves become communicative right and allow students to interact with them um, on their own terms uh, don't know what that looks like yet uh, I'm interested to see if any schools would approach this but having spaces that talk to students on their own is is really an, uh, quite a disruptive idea Beyond these kinds of, of new technologies, we know that we also have other digital kinds of landscapes uh, uh, emerging. You know that kids are using Minecraft, and Minecraft is working their way into school schools. Beyond making and digital environments, we know that maker spaces and making is an incredibly important direction and schools are going. This is Betabox. It's on demand. Uh, it's an on demand maker space. It's in a shipping container. It looks like this inside. And so this is a you know a completely disruptive way to think about spaces, spaces for learning inside a shipping container. Pretty cool. You know, beyond those kinds of spaces, we're also looking at a highly connected social space. Students today expect this kind of social space, uh, inhabit it, 
This is a uh, this is an example of a third place, and a third place is defined as uh, for adults it's between work uh, any space between work and home, for students it's any space between school and home. So you know I work in these kinds of environments all the time as an independent freelancer, and I see students of high school age in these spaces interacting. You can see the technology in this space. And the cool thing is that, you know, here's a student that's actually a part of, uh, she's a collegiate college student, and she's uh, Northern Illinois University. She's working on an online course. You see the traditional book and, and uh, worksheet, or it uh, looks like presentations, a PowerPoint presentation printout uh, on the right-hand side, but she's working uh, interactively, uh, doing homework from Northern Illinois on, on their, in their Blackboard interface. And at the same time she's doing that, she's actually working with this on her uh, cell phone. It's Chug Study, and, and this is a way in which she can get take a certainly a, just a picture of her of her homework and get response and tutoring experience. So we start to see where we have spaces that are informal beyond school that students inhabit, where they're capable of connecting uh, to traditional kinds of elements of school. That use non-traditional uh, learning assistant kinds of tools in this process. It's, a, it's an amazing kind of ecology that's emerging that's blending you know traditional physical learning in schools with on-demand kind of socialized or more social kinds of spaces where kids have choices and decisions to make about how they learn, where they learn, and, and who they learn with. You know, that also for me is, you know, beyond working in a Starbucks or in a coffee shop, I've made the decision to work in a co-working space. And, you know, for me, this is a more professional kind of space. It's an on-demand space, again, that I pay a monthly fee to to be able to work with other entrepreneurs, other freelancers. And it's filled with the capability. And you can see the, the notion of all the different kinds of spaces that I can assume even on this main floor at any given point. So it's about about allowing me to pick and choose the space I want to support the kind of learning or kind of activity that I want to engage in. And that's all part of it. So, you know, in the landscape of, of learning spaces now involves traditional educational spaces in school becoming more capable, more flexible, and more agile. But it also involves a much wider range of expectations for space and how it serves learning relative to digital spaces for learning and then on-demand informal locations for learning uh, that students can pick and choose how they interact in. So beyond that, and going back to school, then we can take a look at making. This is Kevin Jarrett's work in New Jersey. You see the experience uh, in, in his makerspace. Um, it's Care Think Design Act, right? Uh, there's his expectations for learning broadly broadcast to his kids and always a reminder of what they do and how they do it within this space. And then, you know, it looks like this, and this is a completely different kind of experience. Now you have you have much more industrial feel uh, where kids have now the option to craft things that are important to them. They can walk into this space and, and create things of meaning and of value and that are representative of their understanding and knowledge. It also allows them to engage in really reflective and purposeful design questions that are community-based where they can actually use a design process now to, in this space, craft solutions for people to things that matter for those people. And the other thing that I really like about, about the space is this, is the slat wall, the white wall on the side where it allows kids to display their work in progress. So it, it not only does it uh, function in storage of products that are ongoing, but it also celebrates the work that's taking place in the space. And it really manifests ideas and allows other kids to see what other kids are working on. That's a really cool idea. You know, the other opportunity, and there's, there's, there's spaces beyond school. Uh, the kids who engage in creative and thoughtful kinds of activities that allow them to follow their own passions. This is Metamedia in Evanston, Illinois, and it looks like this inside. And so this is a, a remodeled uh, lobby of a YMCA that gives kids options for after school, particularly middle school kids. It's only open to middle school kids, but allows them to, to explore crafting media uh, that allows them to follow their passions, working with tutors and mentors, adult tutors and mentors that that are passionate about media, that, that are passionate about kids, and help them understand ways in which they can 
advance their understanding of media and, and what it means for them and for their lives in a space beyond school that they can go to after school or on the weekends. And these are really terrific ideas. So we start to see not only kids have options in school to explore, but actual locations beyond school that are much more academic and rigorous in nature like this space as opposed to like a Starbucks or something like that. It gives them options to take learning in different directions. So, you know, given that, um, you know, in terms of the landscape, going back to that question, what we want to be able to do is focus on, on some things here um, that make, will make sense and pull this together. So, you know, in any kind of space, we're looking at content, right? Kids have to know their world and understanding content still imp is still important. But what content you're going to teach is, is a key thing, right? The content can be used to, you know, is to help develop skills or what they can do. Content is what you know. Skills are what you can do. Collaboration is an example of a skill, right? And then mindsets and how you think uh, is, is another kind of uh, way to think about the kinds of experiences that you can design in space. You know, how do we, how do, what do we know? What can we do? How do we think? And all those things factor into learning dispositions that allow us to approach any learning kind of condition, any kind of new kind of experience with a set of behaviors and skill sets that allow us to be effective learners in that new condition. So literally, what we're looking at in terms of landscape are the kinds of spaces and understanding of the spaces, whether physical or digital, whether they're formal or informal, whether in school or out of school, that allows kids to develop what they know, what they can do, how they think, and how they act as learners. Along the same lines, now the landscape of learning is like this. It can occur anytime with anyone of any size group from meaning individual to groups of two to groups of thousands in a, in a massive online open course. It allows people to explore learning according to their own path using any kind of device. And now literally the landscape of learning is that it should occur in any kind of space. So when you look at content, skills, mindsets, and the development of learning disposi dispositions that allow people to learn anytime any, with anyone of any, of any size group down any path of exploration according to their own passions with any kind of device or technology or any kind of learning tools in different kinds of spaces that becomes a much more complex ecology of how learning takes place. The question I have for you is really then how can we begin to move past an educational model that is tethered to time and place okay, and move closer to learning that's immersive, mobile, collaborative and social and that's a tremendous challenge for schools but it's a worthy challenge so i'm going to leave you with that idea of the landscape that we're exploring now or can explore now creates that kind of shift to become untethered to time and place and to create new conditions and create new understandings that reflect a contemporary education in the kinds of experiences that allow kids develop into temporary, contemporary kinds of learners that maximize their own identity, their own dispositions for learning, and their own passions for the way in which learning should occur. That, of course, has to take place in a variety of spaces that all talk and work together. So up next, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to be jumping into a way in which you can use that mindset uh, uh, to address and support the development of a way through that landscape and develop and think about the way in which a process can support an intelligent and thoughtful and purposeful way to address the changes that are taking place in education in terms of what we'd like to see students be able to do, but also how can spaces be created that are capable of supporting those kinds of trajectories. So uh, video three is on process. It's upcoming.